we've seen a rebound in uh, energy uh, prices to a certain degree. We've seen a rebound in housing prices. So when you look at the Case Shiller index, for example, you know house prices were correcting. Now they've kind of stabilized. They they've gone back up uh, in aggregate. Um, and you know overall, I think that's kind of the trend we're in now, in the sense that we've had a permanent um, boost in terms of how much money's in the system. Um, even as the Fed tries to draw down their balance sheet, there's still money coming in from the rever reverse repo facility. Um, right. So it's kind of balanced at the current time. Um, I, I think, you know, around the margins, I kind of see a selling here for a period of time because there's still downward pressure on a number of industries from these rate hikes. Um, but part of what's fueling the inflation um, is the very large fiscal deficits. And what makes this kind of different from other cycles, at least up to a point, is that most of the money supply growth did not come from the banking sector. They didn't, it did not come from credit creation. It came from large fiscal deficits. Um, and we have very high public debt levels now. And so the challenge is, you know, the whole process of raising rates is meant to slow down bank lending. It's, it's meant to slow down kind of the main uh, driver right. of that money creation, which in the 70s worked because you had, you know, you had low public debt. Uh, you, had, you had very high demographic driven uh, bank lending. Um, but in this era and back in the 1940s, most of the money creation is from those fiscal deficits. And so the problem is when you raise rates, you actually increase deficits. We have 100%, over 100% debt to GDP. If you raise rates, that actually pours more money into the economy. And so I think they're kind of in this like, kind of like balancing act here where, where it's going to be hard to fully land the plane. Anytime they mature and get reissued, um, it goes up. And so, you know, if you run the numbers, uh, you know, we get up to something like 1.7 trillion on interest expense annually if you just hold rates where they are and have the, the full weighted average eventually catch up to that. Now, we wouldn't get that in the next couple quarters, um, but basically we, we continue to add tens or hundreds of billions of dollars in interest expense to the existing deficit uh, at the current time. So I, I do think that we're going to continue to see very high bond issuance uh, and, and continue to see uh, extremely high and still rising interest expense, which is which is part of the deficit and is, and is a source of money that is flowing out into the economy. I'd be a little bit hesitant to um, say push the shorts here. I mean, we already had a very large down move in bonds. Uh, I, I've been a bond bear for years. I mean, the, the, the speed of this move even was kind of surprising to me, um, even as a bond bear. Um, and so I, you know, the real rates are starting to get interesting. I can see, for example, why someone would want to go long tips here. Um, you get a mm -hmm. decent real yield on your position. The, you know, the problem is not that the, you know at this point I think they're appropriately priced, um, but the challenge is there's just too much supply relative to demand. Basically, the types of buyers that are not so there's a couple main pools of of buyers for treasuries. They could be the foreign sector, but they're not buying because the dollar index is strong. So they're in currency defense mode. They're not they're not rapidly accumulating reserves. Um, there's the Fed, but they're not buying. They're actually net selling uh, by letting bonds mature off their balance sheet. Uh, there's banks, which were big buyers uh, recently, but it, over the past year, that's that's reversed now. So so banks are no longer um, buyers, and so that leaves only domestic non-bank entities. So insurance companies, asset managers, households. You know, you and me. Um, we're the kind of the only uh, buyers left, and you know we're generally. When we buy bonds, we don't buy them on leverage in the way that these like money creators can. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's really only so much uh, that can be absorbed. And so it's more of a mechanical issue than investors assessing them and saying that they're inappropriately priced. Um, and I think that's that's the challenge right now. Um, right. And so I, I do see ongoing problems that continue to occur. We could pause here. You know, um, you know, bonds could get a little bit of a bid after such an, an oversold condition. Um, but the risk reward is still relatively unattractive when you can hold T bills, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and to the extent that I would get duration, I, I think tips are are interesting. But the whole bond complex is just it's still a mess. But in general, any sort of multi month prediction is challenging. Um, there's all sorts of things that can happen. But in general, I view a lot of risk assets, including Bitcoin, as probably being kind of range bound uh, during that time period. Um, I don't see a lot of new liquidity coming to market. Um, but I also don't see a high likelihood of major crashes. But I mean, you know, if you if you get a, a like a <coughs> like a liquidity problem in the bond market, that's where you could get a pretty severe drop in some of these risk right. assets. Um, when you look at Bitcoin uh, price action historically, um, 
you know, this won't tell you anything on a day to day basis, but on, a, on like a, a longer term basis, the major correlate it has is with global broad money in dollar dominated terms. So if you get global M2, what is the total value of it denominated in dollars? And is that, you know, the, the rate of change, right? So what is the year of year figure of that look like? Um, Bitcoin tends to be highly correlated with that. So basically, mm -hmm. it's, it's a way of saying that Bitcoin is correlated with monetary inflation, uh, which which is different than and precedes CPI inflation. And so during periods of rise in liquidity, either because, you know, central banks around the world are printing or banks are making a lot of credit or the dollar is weakening because that's the denominator for, for global M2 in dollar terms. Uh, when any of those major factors are kind of prevailing, Bitcoin is usually doing quite well. Um, and when, you know, the majority of those factors are contracting and global M2 is, you know, flat or, or down, uh, that tends to put uh, negative pressure on Bitcoin. Uh, and or so at least that's the demand side. So the way I would yeah. describe it is that over the course of this bear market, the supply side is tightened in the sense that fast money from the prior bull market has largely been washed out. A lot of coins have gravitated towards strong hands, people that are just dollar cost averaging in, hodlers. Uh, you know, that that's kind of a pattern we see in bear markets. Um, and so there's like basically a coiled spring there. Uh, there's not a lot of liquidity for buyers that want to come in. I mean, there's just not a lot of coins kind of ready to, to, to leave hands. Um, but then the question becomes, what sparks the next uh, wave of demand? And I right. think it will likely be the next rise in global M2. And I don't really see that as likely in, say, the next one quarter, two quarters. Um, that doesn't mean you can't fluctuate. I mean, you, you could go anywhere but up uh, over 30,000. You could go you could go retest 20,000. I don't really have um, a firm view on that level of range, but I think until it, it would probably to see a bigger move, we'd have to see a pretty significant move in, in global M2. Other than maybe a, a spot ETF or something, that, that might be the other sure. catalyst. It's just a wild card that we don't know if that's going to happen in the next six months or not. I think that there probably would at least be a short-term pump. Uh, whether or not that would have staying power, I think that's a good question. Um, I don't think you'd see net necessarily massive inflows right away. Um, but the market, you know, market participants would have to then adjust what the next bull right. market is going to look like if a spot ETF exists versus one that does not exist, right? So Bitcoin is not just buyers and sellers right now. It's also people looking out into the future and saying, what is the probability that this thing is going to be successful, right? So what does the regulatory clarity look like? Uh, where are the sources of buyers going to come from? So overall, that is a new variable on on forward expectations of price, which which is for most participants would be pretty constructive. Lynn Alden, a well-respected financial expert, has recently expressed concerns about the stock market. She thinks things might get rough due to things like prices going up, supply problems, and world conflicts. But remember, predictions can be tricky. It's a good idea to be smart with your money and not put all your eggs in one basket. Lynn Alden's warning is a reminder that the financial world can be a bit unpredictable, so it's important to stay informed and be ready for bumps in the road. If you found this video helpful, make sure you hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.